up on than I am. But I want to focus here on really relationships in particular. And we're talking about agents and managers. Those are, for an artist, the biggest relationships, uh, the most important to your career. They can change your career in either direction. Um, and first of all, it might be helpful to just give a nutshell, a snapshot of my career. And you can know where I've, where I've been, where I'm coming from. And thank you, Ashley. I, if I can live up to all that, I, I can. That'd be great. So anyway, um, I start, I grew up in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, uh, 90 miles east of Minneapolis, a town of about 40,000 at the time. We didn't get major concerts. And I had a, a much more of a small town mentality than was appropriate probably. I didn't think I would ever see anything special, go anywhere special, do anything special. I'd just read about it probably. But at, finally, at the age of 19, I thought, I can buy a ticket to a concert in Minneapolis, 90 miles away, and see this myself. And I just fell in love with the uh, professional performances. The first show was Steve Miller Band and the Bonzo Dog Doodah Band, from which at least one of the guys from Monty Python came out of that band. They're a very fun band. Um, so. Anyway, uh, I was knocked out and within three months, myself and friends were presenting concerts. And then I also got involved in helping community centers and everything around the area, bring in artists from, from bigger cities. And uh, eventually uh, I got invited to join an agency in Milwaukee. So I went down there with the idea of spending a few weeks getting the hang of what agencies do and then going finishing my last year of college. Well, I got addicted and I didn't go back to college. Uh, but after a few months, uh, my boss went to change the agreement that we had, not in my favor. And I said, if I quit, will you pay me? Because my pay was commissions on bookings in the future. And he said, yes, so I quit. And I'm packing up my bags to go back and finish my last year of college. And a bass player from one of the bands I was working with, Mark Sidecheck, actually came down to my apartment, which is a basement apartment I shared with a couple others, and uh, said, what if our band, the Hound Dog Band, and the Ox also left the agency and you managed us? Which I thought was kind of unreal because I had only been an agent for about three months. Um, at any rate, uh, I said yes. They took a few days to vote on it. I said yes. And then I went to another regional agency to see if they would book the band that I, the bands I was now managing. And they said, yes, but we'd like you to, to be an agent also. So I joined their company as well, being an agent and managing these two artists. And over the next five years, I also got experience in buying talent for a stage at Summerfest in Milwaukee and for several clubs. Uh, and the cl that was really in my career because I, the clubs were focused on jazz and blues. And uh, that's where I first met people who later became clients, John Hammond, Muddy Waters, Willie Dixon, Mose Allison, John Lee Hooker, all of those people I initially booked in the clubs and later grew into uh, uh, representing them. At a certain point, I got invited to an agency in San Francisco that was an offshoot of Keystone Corner Jazz Club. So it was heavy on the jazz. And, but I was to bring in the other sides of the music. And uh, I worked there about three months. I never got paid. I kept getting excuses as to why I wasn't being paid. Came to work one day and the phones were cut off because they hadn't paid the phone bill either. So I, uh, I went back, went to my apartment, no phone at the office, you know, so uh, went downtown, bought a typewriter, some, a bunch of paper, staplers, all the things I thought I, basics I would need. And I'd only, I brought almost nothing to San Francisco. I bought a bed for $35 from the previous tenant in my apartment. And so I would sit on the bed during the day. That was my only furniture, period. Um, so I'd sit on the bed during the day making calls and trying to do bookings. And then at night I took a shelf out of the closet, put it on the bed, put the typewriter on that shelf and then typed contracts and letters and everything. No internet, of course, at that time, no social media. This is. 1976. Um, so uh, Rosebud began with next to nothing. And luckily it grew and, and uh, you know, I, I took in other artists uh, and I took in uh, other staff and uh, it eventually worked out. The first couple of years I was audited by the IRS because they said, you can't live on $1,500 a year, can you? You know, and I said, well, 
t-shirts given to me by bands. I've had the same jeans and t tennis shoes for ages. And I sleep in my office, whatever, you know, so at any rate, and I had a couple of dollars left over from, from my previous jobs. I got in an accident, somebody smashed into my car. I got a $350 from the insurance company. I had, I couldn't fix the car because I needed the money for rent and everything. So it's, it came from somewhat humble beginnings and, uh, but has worked out really well in the end. I've gone on to, you know, managing book artists. A lot of our artists are better appreciated in Europe than other countries than in America. So we did a lot of international work right from the start. Um, at any rate, uh, there's a little snapshot of my career. Uh, this whole thing, I know I would love to regroup in two hours because I always remember what I should have said about an hour afterwards, but, but well, at any rate, uh, we can always have a part two if we need it. So <laughs> if you're just dying to do this again, so, uh, but so go uh, ahead. I was, what I was going to, if, 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 if are, are, you, are you done? I mean, you, you didn't even begin to cover your entire career, but if, if, for those of you who, who want to know more about Mike, I think Wikipedia does a good job of summing it up and you can also go to uh, uh, Rosebud's uh, website um to to learn more about his extensive experience um but Mike I mean I, I what I would like to start with and this may be obvious some, more obvious to some of the folks on the zoom but um for some people it's not for some people they they I think they they think they know what a manager does but let's let's clear that up let's talk about like the the general role of a manager and like how that scope can vary well, I know one of the things we talked about is agent versus manager. So I could sum mm -hmm. up agent role much more easily. Okay. Responsible for, and the difference. The agent is responsible for uh, booking the shows. Generally, traditionally, it's booking the live performances. And it, it's, it, like a lot of things in the music business, there's blurry lines between things. And it boils down to whatever the artist and his representative agree should be the duties. And uh, so now an agent may also, and we did, uh, help artists uh, get in films or television shows and things of that nature. But the agent is, for the most part, is responsible for the live performance dates. Um, and that's one of the more defined roles in the business. A manager, I think of as a funnel of information to and from the artist and the rest of the world. Um, the artist says, I want to do this, 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 and this. And the manager goes out and works with an, an attorney in many cases, or the record label, or with the agent, and, or merchandise company, or publishing company, whatever, and finds out what's available, whether or not the goals can be met or they have to be adjusted, and then brings all that info, funnels all that information back to the artist. And one thing uh, artists should be aware of is they are the boss, you know. Um, you want to get information uh, from as many different sources as possible and be as knowledgeable as possible and listen to the people that have the experience in different areas and the relationships. But in the end, the artist is the boss. That's who we work for. That's who pays us. And uh, so uh, it's really important to know as much as possible and being part of things like this and any, any others, not just me, but any other situations like this or anything you can read, uh, check online to absorb as much as possible and filter out what may not be the best op options and uh, learn as much as you can. Uh, you can be presented with a contract that uh, might be as good as it gets or it might be horrible. Uh, knowing the difference is huge. And there's a million horror stories in the business. Mm -hmm. and I'm true. So a lot of people get their defenses up and I call the syndrome, the offensive defense, where somebody is so, so concerned about defending themselves from being taken advantage of. And they've heard so many horror stories that they end up being mistrustful of everybody. And there's some very significant people in the business who have been right. burned and, and just end up being, nobody really wants to work with them. The one factor that changes that is if they're a big success, people will put up with uh, somebody who's a pain in the tail to work with. But on the lower level, you don't want to have any points against you. There can be right. situations in your career where you're up for some opportunity and there's other artists up for 
similar uh, credits up for the same opportunity. And the person making the decision can think, well, they all seem pretty much alike, but this guy's a pain in the tail to deal with. This guy is the opposite. And you wanna make dealing with you an experience that people want to, uh, want to repeat. Well, and that's, I know, I know that, you know, you talk a lot about relationship building, and this is a challenge that I, you know, that I hear all the time, you know, that's, that's sort of, there's this tension between, you know, wanting to give all the, con all control to the manager and the manager needing that to do his or, or their job versus like what you were saying is that the artist is the boss. And, and, you know, I think I'd love your insight on how you reconcile those two competing um there's 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 two competing issues because it is it can be attention and i think that i think that really comes down to you know having like, like that relationship between the artist and the manager and it just working right but and a lot of that has to do with trust and you know like you said you know making sure that you know as an artist that you're informed and you understand what this relationship entails but i'm curious to know you know when you were talking about you know the, a really good deal versus a really bad deal. What is a really what is a really good deal and a really good relationship look like to you? Well, first of all, you mentioned trust, and that's huge. And mm -hmm. in order to trust somebody, you have to get to know them. Uh, somebody shouldn't be so excited. But I got a record deal. Look at the con you know I got this contract, and uh, and get all excited about that without reading the fine print. And uh, your question again was uh, once again actually the specific question at the end there. Well, it's just how, how you manage that tension between the artist being the boss and, and having creative control, but the manager with the manager being able to actually do his or her their job, because you have to as an artist, you have to give up a lot of that control to the manager. Personally, I don't see the artist having to give up control. I, I see the artist is uh, delegating uh, the work to reach the goals and management in particular agencies. You can come and go a little bit more there. Uh, it's not as uh, intimate a relationship. And so agencies can have a much longer roster of artists. They're, they've got that one focus of getting jobs. Management's a much more intimate relationship. And before getting into it, they shouldn't think I got a manager. Wow. You know, they should really know that they've got a manager that understands them, believes in them and has the time to work with them. Um, I'm getting somebody well, giving and I and I can I can field some of these questions, Mike, but that 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 was something that I was go going to ask you about. So, you know, what when you are looking for or when you were looking, you know, to um hire or to seek new clients, right, to your roster. And I know there was a, a period where you just could not take any more. Um, but but when you when you were seeking, you know, to represent artists, what were the kind of qualities that you were looking for? Well, that's a that's a really key question. Um, first of all, and I, I think a lot of agencies uh, might focus on how much money can be made here. You know, mm -hmm. and I maybe have more patience for some of the problems than I do because I was really into relationships. And anyway, the first thing for me was being moved. Does this sort of move me? Um, and then also, are we right for each other? Um, if it's uh, if it was a hardcore country band, I probably wouldn't be right for them. Or a rap artist, or a very pop artist. We really dealt with roots music, and generally on the grittier side, actually, rather than a really polished pop kind of thing. Um, so, do we fit? And there's also somebody moving from another agency, where uh, I've had people approach me, an artist who is selling out significant theaters on a consistent basis, wanting to work with us. And I, I knew what they were making. I can I get Polestar magazine every week still. They show box office grosses. I see what the person is making. And I, and I knew what they were looking for, but they were already getting as much money as was appropriate. And if I sign somebody, they've got high hopes and they're not really appropriate, then they're get, there's going to be disappointment and a bad, a bad vibe down the road. So you want to have a happy family long term. So we want to know that uh, we can work with the people. Also, that the genre is correct. I actually worked with Tony Williams uh, for a while, and I love Tony Williams. He was a monster. He was a teenager when he worked with Miles Davis, and then went on to his own bands and everything. But and I really loved him as a person, and I loved what he was doing. But 
but I felt like we were not the right agency for it. So I ended up recommending <laughs> with Ed Portland's agency, who specialized much more in jazz. And if a jazz <laughs> had a cancellation, they would normally call Ted. They wouldn't call us because we didn't have that many. Other. So I, um, are we right for each other? Um, are we going to get along with each other? There's a few situations where I passed, as an agent, I passed on an artist because of the manager um, who had known not to be very effective, or in one case, um, who, uh, sorry, break my concentration. Um, I talked to the manager who was just taking on a new manager, and we talked to her about 45 minutes, and he was just off into other territory, and I thought, this person's going to use up my life without getting to the point, you know. So it's got to be a uh, a good relationship and an understanding relationship, and everybody with the same goals. And it takes well, communication. You know? And that's not, you know, the way you describe that and and your approach to management is, I I think that it's the gold standard, but it's it's not it's not something that you know all managers by any means um, subscribe to that sort of uh, that sort of mentality and that sort of um, approach to management. Um, how important is it that that the manager, so first of all, let me go back, sorry about that. Um, how does an artist prepare to even have a conversation with a potential manager? Because you were talking about, you know, this trust and, you know, what you look for, but, you know, before, you know, you even get it get to that you know place where you're having these conversations how does an artist prepare themselves you know when is it when is it a good idea for an artist to seek out this type of representation because not all artists need management I think a lot of artists think that all artists need management and you know it's just not for everyone right so who when, when is when is the time to and when is the time for an artist to seek to seek representation? How do they prepare? And then and then how do they how do they find folks like you? Well, um, several questions there. But as far as the time, um, when the artist feels like they they're they're prepared to go further in their career, and uh, you build the career. Uh, there's a little line I use. I hope I can remember here that like, that's key for. Artists, and it's key for a lot of businesses, is develop awareness to the degree, positive awareness, to the degree that people want to work with you or spend their time catching your concerts or their money buying your merchandise or your records, in addition to or instead of their other opportunities, their other options. So you're just always building positive, uh, positive awareness. And if you've got, if you've developed a following, I mean, a manager. It's hard for a manager to get involved from the beginning, and things have changed a lot. You know, now maybe some of these whole histories on TikTok or something, which is not my world. But uh, we always looked at artists that are not trendy but are going to have uh, indefinitely lengthy careers because it's uh, about their their talent, not their trend, their attachment to a trend. But uh, if the artist feels like there's more than they can do on their own. And there's a uh, potential, they feel there's potential to go much further. And they've got the, they can get the attention of a manager or the appreciation of a manager because they're drawing some people to their that's, show. Yeah, that's what, that's what I was kind of getting to. And I'm glad you brought that up because it's just so audience appeal is part of that, right? The, the initial audience appeal. So the artist has to, you know, have the rapport, you know, have, you know, did not have a bad reputation, right? For doing business and, you know, have a following. And and like you said, that's easy to track. But how big of a following is it is enough is enough to attract a, a manager? And and so two part question. Sorry about that, Mike. You know what? You know when? You know what kind of volume or what kind of you know um, what what kind of spectrum of work? And you know if even if it's just gigs, do you look at you know when when you're ready to? invest the time to, you know, develop the artist even further. Um, well, we'll start with that. I'll, I'll save the second part. I'll uh, you know, give an example. Uh, Betty LeVette, um, she's now played Carnegie Hall nine times. She's played for the pre-inaugural event for Obama with duetting with Bon Jovi. She's done all sorts of things. I just inducted her into the Blues Hall of Fame in May. When I first saw her, 
she had sold almost no records. Uh, she'd been out of the business for some time. I was on a panel with somebody uh, just before that, and they talked about how they would check sound scans before signing an artist and see sound scan shows how many records an artist sold each week. And the person was looking at that before signing an artist. And I was thinking, I know this artist hasn't sold anything, but she put on an amazing show, an amazing, passionate uh, show. And I believed in what she could do. And so I signed her in spite of the fact that all the other aspects didn't look good. Even Trombone Shorty, I came back after seeing Trombone Shorty and being knocked out by him, my agents. And it's like a band led by a trombone player. And he's barely ever played outside of New Orleans at that time, you know, and, I had to hard sell my own agents on him, but uh, I'm really glad you did that, by the way. So anyway, go ahead. So you know, he, and he was a he's a great performer and a great musician. Uh, so it's there's two ways that you know there's so many variations in artists, so many variations in careers, so many variations in managers and how they relate to each other. Um, personally, I'm I'm heavy on the passion part, you know, and not as, and if the fashion is there and the performance is there, mm -hmm. then it's a matter of finding the audience that's gonna appreciate it. And like I said, for our artists, a lot of the time, the bigger audience was in Europe, actually. And we, JJ Kiel, I represented for 30 years. And he, he was an extremely unique character who cared less about fame and fortune. Um, he could draw a thousand people in New York, but he could draw 10,000 people in London and various other places around Europe. And he cared so little about fame and fortune in 30 years of representing him, he only took one offer of a tour of Europe. And all wow. he was getting them all the time. Can He can make $150,000 a night all across Europe or $10,000 a night in New York. And he went, ah, call me up and say, book me some dives. You know, he just enjoyed playing music and not being in the spotlight. He was kind of an anomaly in that way. I mean, I know that there are others, but very, very few and far between. I know that our New Orleans artists can really relate to uh, the European and some other international markets, you know, uh, paying their dues to paying higher dues for 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 their uh, for their services. I mean, they do really well on and, you know, touring internationally, um, often much better than they do here at home. That's a common complaint that, you know, has has been has been lodged for you know decades, but you know New Orleans is New Orleans, so people stay here, and, and we're very lucky and very happy about that. Um, going back to you know establishing and developing these relationships, so in your case, you're saying it's more common for you to seek out, like you follow, you know, when you were managing artists, you would follow um, certain certain artists to determine whether or not to to seek out the having that initial conversation about representation. Or was there ever a case where an artist approached you out of the blue and you ended up, you know, working with them? Yeah, actually, I, I generally, after the initial years, was not seeking out artists. We had a thousand to fifteen hundred artists come to us a year, look, seeking representation, and I had the policy of keeping things small because I'd seen artists go on to big agencies and get lost in the shuffle. So, um, so we were turning away artists all the time and rarely. As a matter of fact, to the degree that I was, I almost looked for reasons not to, not to sign an artist because uh, I was working. You know, there was no more time to add any more work. Um, and management-wise, I never asked an artist to manage them. Everybody I ever managed asked me, and I think every case, every single case, I was their agent first, and so we'd had time to get to know each other and trust each other, know where they're, where we're at, and then they asked me about managing them and uh, so, so when you made that transition did you have to did you have to conclude your relationship as an agent with them or was there a way for you to separate that out because I know in California and it's not like this in Louisiana but there there are several states that prohibit you know a manager from booking gigs um at the same you know as an as an agent it's not the case here in fact it often is the case here that managers that's their main job is to book gigs but but that's we have different rules here so um yeah. misunderstood situation about what the what technically it is not i even dealt with lawyers about, about this and they were thinking i was being sneaky doing both i had to educate the lawyer on the situation because what the situation is is that managers are somewhat unrestricted in in california but Anybody who secures employment for an artist must have a talent agency license. 
So a manager could, the difference is that with a talent agency license, you could book and manage, but you were limited in how, how much commission overall you could take. And so one case of an artist I dealt with, they would get, they were paying 50% to a manager, which is crazy. Um, that is that crazy. You wouldn't be able to get a talent agency license because the maximum allowable combined commission talent, booking and management was 25%. And how does that break down? How did that break down generally um, break for manager down. versus versus a talent versus the agent? The law didn't break it down. The law just said the maximum you can, can take for any individual gig is 25%. Um, and it's a good topic to touch on for a second is mm -hmm. uh, how much you pay somebody. Um, booking agencies typically take 10%. I've, I've heard of some smaller ones that take more, but probably because the artists are making very little money. And in order to make ends meet, they have to charge a higher commission. Um, some major agencies, in order to sign a very major artist, might offer somewhat less than 10%. In fact, years ago, back in the 70s, the Eagles were in their first incarnation. And I know that they were booked by an agency that, that was paid $250 per day to, uh, to contract. And basically, I think maybe the manager was making the deals and the agency was just there to to deal with the paper and chase the uh, chase the deposits and everything. So like so many other aspects of the business, it's whatever two parties agree to. Right. Uh, in our case, we took 10% for booking. And if I was managing the artist also, I would take 10% for the management side of live performance. Uh, oh, would you take 10% of gross or net? Gross. And that's uh, really important because, I mean, mm -hmm. if an artist wanted to really mess with their manager or agent, they could say we're flying first class. We're doing the more money they spend, the net, then the smaller the net gets, and the agent right. gets so much less. But I also took a different percentage, a higher percentage for uh, uh, record deals and publishing deals because there I did work on the net. You know, if there's a hundred thousand uh, dollar recording budget, and they spend ninety thousand dollars of it making the record, I'm only commissioning on ten thousand dollars. So I took a higher percentage on that. Well, I think it's really important that you just address that because it's something that, you know, I, I, you know, address with clients often and it's, you know, generally speaking, um, most of the contracts that I've seen um, are, you know, the manager wants, you know, almost always these days, 20% of gross and, and, and this manager, you know, no one's even heard of, right. But this is like the standard thing and, and artists are willing to, 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 to engage in these agreements and then they get stuck in them and you know then the manager doesn't do anything and and they can't go anywhere right and so because of that another manager you know can't can't work with them and in even worst case scenarios where a manager does do you know the little the smallest amount of work so that these contracts you know are still enforceable you know i i've i've seen a lot of clauses where um in contracts where you know the post termination where the manager is still getting, you know, a hefty percentage, which doesn't incentivize another manager to work with you. Um, have you dealt with that in the past? Uh, An artist that had previous management where, you know, they had, they had that, they had the post term because I'm seeing more and more and more of that. And I've had like, I, that's, that's the most common challenge that I've dealt with as of late is artists who are seeking to, you know, uh, who are seeking alternate representation, even have alternate representation lined up, but either can't because they're not, you know, they're not out of their term or worse, um, th they signed a deal that's enforceable where they have to continue to give royalties, not royalties, but, but revenue to the, the previous manager. And therefore, you know, the other manager doesn't have incentive to work with them. If it's just came across that specific situation, uh, but it emphasizes the need to be more knowledgeable and check out your agreements in advance, be super careful about any long-term contract and to go never sign a long-term contract. I have, I worked with one lawyer for about five years on various different things. And I had spent so much time making record deals that he thought I was a lawyer actually all this time. And it was only after five years that I let him, or it came up that I was not a lawyer, but I was making corrections on his ideas and everything. But in spite of really getting very familiar with record contracts, I would still go to uh, go to a lawyer and just double check that there wasn't anything I was missing. Also, another thing 
even with the familiarity of the contracts, the record contracts used to be very formula with you change the royalty rate, you change the term, a couple other numbers change, but uh, that changed drastically. And so, and with sampling, for instance, was never, in, it didn't exist, you know, and all of a sudden sampling becomes part of the contract after a record deal, the record companies got sued along with the artist for unauthorized use of a sampler, things of that nature. So um, at any rate, yeah, as a matter of fact, I did a deal with J.G. Keel and Eric Clapton on a, a, a record they did together. And Eric and his manager were wonderful to deal with. I'm not saying anything about COVID concerns, but um, I had a lot of work with them. And uh, I received a contract for sharing this, uh, this record they did together. And it was incredibly excellent, you know, and, and generous. And I, but I sent it to my lawyer anyway, just in case I was missing something. And he called me back and he said, did you negotiate this? <laughs> and I said, I wish I could take credit for it, but it was handed to me. You know, so, um, but the point being, always check. You know, yeah, no, I think that's, that, that's really important and to do things, to be proactive and do it in advance. Otherwise, you know, you end up, you, you end up in reaction mode and that, that's when you, you know, become defensive, right? Constantly defensive and, you know, unable to work with to some degree, you know, whether it's, you know, just a lot of the work on the agent and manager is troubleshooting and mm -hmm. avoid the trouble and all the time and all the stress and, and maybe cost by sorting everything out in advance. Um, so really be careful on, on agreements. Absolutely. And I, and I do, just to go back to the way that, you know, you, um, you know, you budget, um, and the way you, um, the way you, you know, extrapolate out the different revenue sources from, you know, your cut. I think that's, that's something that, you know, that the folks that I've worked with are not accustomed to seeing because it's general, because it's just a flat, you know, rate, uh, of the revenue that, the that the manager takes, you know, for all, for all revenues earned, right? And I think it's really important, like you said, um, to to separate out, you know, the different revenue streams from each other, and and it, that that's good for that's it's good for the artist and it's good for the manager, um, and provides more opportunities um, potentially. So I, I'm I'm hope I'm hoping that that um, our clients are listening to that because because it's not something that is customary. Um, in the agreements that that I've seen here, right? So um, pay attention to that um, for everyone on Zoom who doesn't have a background in this. But um, I'm about getting a management contract, unless it's a great management contract with a great manager. And I should I, see in a, well, go ahead. Did I talk? Did I already mention about you know James Lee Stanley and the manager he had he was top of the world, and uh, you know did did nothing for him whatsoever. It's got to believe in you ideally and focus the necessary time on achieving your goals. They can be the biggest agent or manager in the world, but if they don't have time for you, it does you no good whatsoever. But it also, I think you stay away from somebody who's, uh, I, guess, I guess I'm repeating myself, a, a family or other connection that doesn't have any experience. You need somebody- That's really important. Please talk more on that. Mm -hmm. And and the uh, and the time, the the dedication to what you're doing. Uh, they can be the greatest in the world, but if they're not giving you the time, it doesn't help you at all. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for that. Do you want to talk a little bit? I know that you know one of the things that you wanted to go over was um, audience development and how booking and booking venues and working with other media, you know generates you know new audiences and it's something that you know i've talked about with with folks in like policy forums and you know with my own clients and i talk about audience development all the time and the different ways to channel that and i mean you've been in business you're in business for a very long time and like you said i mean when you started everything was you know uh you know all the record sales were physical i mean you've you've been you i don't know if you, i don't it, were eight tracks in in 1976 but you've been through cassettes and cds and downloads and streaming and TikTok and all of that, Facebook, what have you? So, I mean, it, how does how does what is it? You know, how do you? What's the role of a manager? A in in um 
you know, in keeping up with the technology and, and the various consumption trends, right? Um, and then how do you use that to maximize audience development? Well, I've been much more focused on live performance most of my career. Um, and I, you know, I've dealt with all the other aspects too. But um, when you talk about developing our audience for me, I think in terms of literal audience, you know, and, uh, and like I said earlier about de developing a positive awareness to the degree that people choose to check out your music. Um, well, how do they know about your music in the first place? Well, uh, one of the main things, and there's so many different ways now, like we mentioned TikTok and things of that nature, but from a live performance standpoint, I think diving in and being open to benefit situations um, and festivals, especially, and working with other artists, because all three of those areas, they're not making a choice to go out and see your performance in a club when they don't know anything about you you're latching on to a situation where there's already an audience and hopefully some of that audience gets uh, uh, knocked out by what you're doing and you pick up somebody from opening for this act and somebody from being on that festival and somebody from being on this benefit and you just build your audience um, organically. Um, but it's gotta be the right situations too. And that's another role of an agent is to not only book the shows, but are they, reasonable distances from each other that the band doesn't come in totally exhausted because the long drive between the places. Uh, is it the right size venue? You can have 200 people in a 200 seater and it's a sellout and it looks great, but if you have the same 200 people in a 1500 seater, you look like a failure. You know, so it's knowing what is the appropriate cir circumstances to put an artist in. And another huge one is uh, compatible audiences. Um, I actually saw in 1981, I was on tour with George Thorogood touring with the Rolling Stones. And in Los Angeles, they add, it was George Thorogood, uh, Jay Giles band and the Rolling Stones. But in Los Angeles, they added in the front, this new guy, this new up and comer, Prince, who nobody had, had heard of. We had a dressing room trailer right next to their, their trailer. And I too was, I became a huge Prince fan later on. But at the time, I'm like, what are they dressing for Halloween here? Or what's going on, you know? And, and Prince comes on stage to a, a comparatively conservative Rolling Stones audience. And he's wearing like this little black jock strap kind of thing. And, and uh, I've never seen in my life so many things thrown on a stage to add a performance. It was just littered. And after three songs, he walked off. This is the LA Coliseum where it's a bowl. And behind the stage are steps going up to the dressing rooms and everything. And everybody could see Prince walking up the steps Bill Graham stopping him halfway up the steps, convincing him to go back on. You see Prince coming down the steps, going on stage and getting more crap thrown at him. We've never seen anybody get so much thrown at them on a stage or anything thrown. The stage was littered. There was shoes, there was cups, there was everything. You know? So crazy to think uh, of. A year contrast. later, all those people are like, oh yeah, I saw Prince, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm thinking how cool they are, but uh, that was incompatible, you know? Right. Uh, so and what do you do to prevent that from happening? I'm sorry? What do you do for, to prevent that from happening? I think in terms of compatible pairings, you know, and also not only pairings, but venues. You know, if you're an acoustic singer-songwriter, you don't go into a club that is used to having loud rock and everybody talking loud and drinking and everything else and not paying attention to the singer. Um, and vice versa, you don't uh, bring a hard rock band into a coffee house, you know, so you, there's got to be some thought behind it, and the agent is responsible for finding the right places and the compatible bills. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was the Blasters who were popular in the 70s and kind of a rockabilly type of band, and they were thrilled they got on tour with Queen, but the Queen audience couldn't care less about them, and it was painful for the band. They thought it was going to be a big career boost, and it was painful for them because a lot of the audience was in the lobby or not paying attention to them not caring about them, booing maybe, you know. Um, so what big does not necessarily mean better, you know, being on with a big act, it's got to be the right act. Compatible. Right. No, I'm glad you brought that up. You know, I have worked with the local band here. This is not, this is not the Blasters and Queen, not, not, not even remotely the same scenario, but it was basically like a Django Reinhardt cover band, right? And very, very locally, very, you know, 
people love them. But, you know, they really wanted to um, work with and tour with, you know, higher caliber, if you will, or, or better known artists. And so they opened up for Cool in the Gang. And I'm like, now, who put them together? How does that work? Like, can you imagine Django Reinhardt cover band and then like celebrate good times? It just doesn't like even I know that. I have no idea how that happened. It didn't work well. So I think after the first after the first um, attempt, at, I don't even I don't even know if, it, if if I think the band got pulled off stage earlier. Not like Prince, but they may have had stuff thrown at them. I, they did not continue the tour, but but that is a very good lesson because I think a lot of artists are just you know super you know um, uh, like almost obsessed with you know working with with other you know better known artists, but it doesn't always work out that way. You're right. I think that was. Uh, more of a standard in earlier days and record companies would wave a flag about we got so-and-so on tour with so-and-so you know and feel like they had done a wonderful thing and and it's not thinking I, I've always tried to stay away from formulas and that was a formula get the act on with a big artist and it's a ticket to success one that's uh, it and you can't always guess it in advance I was going to use an example but it's not uh complimentary to the artist uh, who is a great artist and I'll, I'll leave that one out but uh, you know it, it was a formula get an artist on with a big tour and that'll be the next step into success doesn't always work that way even when it seems compatible sometimes it doesn't always work but ideally you go for a compatible situation I had George when George Thurgood on the tour with the Stones that really worked and he was giving encores in front of 60, 90,000 people a night. And Ian Stewart, who played keyboards for the Stones and was the original Rolling Stone, um, he was still playing unannounced and un unnamed. He ended up sitting in with George. And when the tour ended, he uh, asked if he could stay, on, stay and play with George and go on George's next tour. A uh, super humble guy, wonderful, wonderful guy. Um, I went to pick him up at the airport at the beginning of the tour. And uh, in Seattle airport, and I was in the baggage plane when, when there wasn't so many blockades for everything. And uh, I couldn't see him, couldn't see him. I went upstairs and there he was with a tiny little gym bag. And I said, don't you have a bag? And he said, well, I, I figured I'd get a new t-shirt for merchandise every day or two, you know? <laughs> and he's just, you know, super humble guy. He ended up dying in his doctor's office of a, waiting for his doctor that had a heart attack and waiting. But he uh, was that's sad. Mm -hmm. yeah, he was an amazing guy. As a matter of fact, here's a weird management twist is that he had a protruding jaw. And the manager of the Stones in the early days felt like that was not a good look for a rock and roll band. And I went with Ian to UCLA, the promoter of the LA shows, also taught us, taught us, uh, taught at UCLA. And he invited Ian to come by. And Ian told the whole audience this. He made this jaw. Um, they didn't like it. Didn't look like a rock star. So I was not on the covers. I was, and he was still, if you read like Keith Richards' book or something like that, he was still the most respected down-to-earth guy. And they would ask him, you know, to give a really down-to-earth opinion about what they should do. Uh, anyway, sorry, tangents. No, it's okay. It's not. A, it's not a tangent. It's not a tangent. I do have one more question for you before we go into the chat. Um, because I thought it was interesting that you said, you know, I I was talking about audience development, and I think of audience development beyond just live performance. And I thought that was interesting that you said that because, um, as I'm as you're saying that, I'm looking at all the records behind you, and it it made me think to um, ask you about, you know, the scope of the role of a manager. I know you produced records, so 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 first of all, as a manager. Like, how does that, how does the record production, how does that work in the context of, of, of management? Um, is that something that, you know, that, I mean, you as a producer that, that you address at the outset or that is, evolves over time and does a really good record end up generating, you know, a more, a, a, a greater and wider audience? Well, you know, ideally, yes, a record does generate a much wider audience, but that's another point I thought about making is anybody who's new into the business here, uh, don't get so upset when you find out it's not fair. It's just plain not fair. You know, um, you do the best you can with the existing circumstances. Um, 
I didn't do so much record production. I was executive producer on a lot of projects, which meant I was coordinating everything and putting things in place. And in particular, the healer for Johnny Hooker, which was a huge record for him, changed his life, actually made an impact on blues world in general. Um, but, and I co-produced a record for Johnny with Van Morrison. Um, I produced a record on the one, now 101 year old National Park Ranger, Betty Reed Soskin, who uh, used to speak at this national park, uh, the Rosie the River, the national park in, in the Bay Area. Just an amazing speaker. I had to bite, almost bite right through my thumb to keep from bawling every time I had to speak. So I did a, that's something I did on my own. I produced that record. But I, and JJ Kale asked me to produce him once. And uh, I just didn't feel confident that I knew enough about the, the, uh, the vocabulary and everything. I'm not a musician to guide musicians and everything. And I told that to Kale and he said, no, all you do is a producer, you just, you know, you drink a cup of coffee and you say, that sounds great, do it again. <laughs> Simple. <laughs> it was a very, uh, you know, down to earth guy. Uh, but anyway, I, I didn't feel I could really qualify with that. So, but uh, I worked with people a lot, you know, not too much on my own as a producer, but as an executive producer, it's, and again, as far as dealing with the artist on that, if you're already the manager and you've got a good relationship, then you're aiming for the same thing. You know, right. you the best record and the most successful record. And you talk about that particular project and what you want to get out of it, what you, how you want to make it. So it's a, cla a positive collaboration that doesn't conflict in any way. So what you're saying is, you know, in, in all of your in all of your relationships, as in in the context of you know management, you and the artist would make the decisions together, and the artist ultimately um, ultimately had um, the decision making authority on when it came to the different projects that you were working on. Yeah, I think just to expand on that a little bit. There's the extremes are right puts together a boy band for instance, especially back about 20 years, and auditions people to be in the band. Maybe uh, BTS might be an example. Now, I don't know their history, but uh, auditioning people to be in the band, bringing in songs from songwriters, bringing in maybe choreographers and people to dress them and everything, and do everything for them. And you just rely on the talent of the singers or whatever, too. Uh, otherwise, it's manufactured by a manager doing everything. He's probably taking making all those decisions. Um, but on the other extreme, you've got people like the Rolling Stones or Eric, uh, Bonnie Raitt, Santana, who, who hire people to do management roles for them. They've been around a long time. They know what they want to do in a record. They want to know what they want to do touring wise. And they have people that they uh, delegate specific roles to. Um, you know, Eric Clapton is similar, but he's got a manager who's a really wonderful manager actually great art great uh, person to deal with and uh, but he doesn't get involved in directing what's going on on a record you know eric knows much better what he wants to do on a record and he's got 50 60 years of experience making records so, so right again it's whatever the two parties between themselves decide the roles and the duties should be between them yeah and i'm glad you covered that again because that's something that comes up you know fairly often where I mean, I think a lot of those nightmare stories you hear about is where the manager has control to the extent that they can sign a musician up for things that they don't want to do. And then, you know, it, beyond that, and when you get into business fairs and, and you know, collecting and distributing and, you know, the, 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 the horror stories that we've all heard about, you know, people stealing from the artist. And I mean, that's not something you've ever done, but it's easy to, to find yourself in that position if you sign a contract that that gives full authority um, and including decision making authority and power of attorney and you know um, um, you know the right to to collect without a right to audit I see that still um, you know and then you're stuck right so it's important to pay attention to those things yeah well um, I was going to say about JJ oh yeah so about control I want in the long term I think everybody's goal in life should be to be happy you know and I want to be happy and I want an artist that I'm working with to be happy and that we have a long-term relationship. So I always would collect as much information as I can about something and deliver it as objectively as possible to the artist 
And I would only step in if I thought they were making a mistake. Then I would say, then I would advise them, I think they're going the wrong direction. I don't do what I want to do instead of theirs. I've done a number of things that were the, the artist wanted to do that I really didn't believe in because they were firm about it. But again, with JJ Keel, he wanted me to just do everything, you know, just, you just put the tour. And I'd say, no, I want you to be happy with, you know, know what you're getting into and appreciate it. And he said, well, that's no fun. I can't blame you then. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> that's funny. But uh, always a great, a great relationship. I worked with him 30 years until he passed. It was, it was my yeah, best. Yeah, you did. Yeah. Well, is there any other, you know, I mean, we're at three and I, and I don't want to, you know, cut into too much of your time because you've already been so generous. Is there anything else that I haven't asked about or that we, that we haven't talked about that we should address? I mean, there always is. We'll start with that. But is there anything that you want to cover today before I get into the chat to see if there are any questions that and and while we're while Mike is answering that questions, if 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 the audience, if you do have the questions, if you could put them into the chat, that would be great. But if yeah. there's anything else you want to address. I had pages of notes and it just became a blur and I just went without them in the end. So um what's really important is what matters to everybody there. Please ask your questions. Uh, love to hear them and hopefully be able to give some insight from my experience. Well, I think you've given a lot of insight and, and we've I think we, you you've covered the you know the nuts and bolts of you know you know sort of the conception of the relationship and you know some of the pitfalls to, to look for or to avoid and and ways to maximize the relationships and these opportunities and um and a distinguishing between you know uh, an agent the role of it the typical role of an agent and a manager is really important too so um i'm going to go through this chat to see if there are any questions i mean there's someone had a question about the the cut of revenue for a manager but i think you covered that i mean it's just it's really you know some states have a cap on what you can you know what you can um take but you know ultimately you know it's it's negotiable right so, um, and that's so it's going to be between between the artist and the manager. What is important to pay attention to, as you uh, so um, well articulated, is the the distinction between net versus gross, and you know the type of expenses that can be that can be made um, and subject to reimbursement, whether it's on the manager side or the artist side, you know. Those 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 are really important points and they're fine points to look at, particularly in the, you know, in the transaction, the initial transaction, because you know, like you said, that can mean the mean the difference between money and no money, right? Yeah, that's mainly comes into play with uh record deals where there's expenses related to the project and I shouldn't be commissioning on the cost of the studio deal. You know, mm -hmm. so um I commissioned on the net. But as far as live performance, um you know, if the artist was booked for five thousand dollars and there was bonuses or percentage earnings beyond that, then the agent should still get a uh, commission on those percentages and earnings beyond that um, because they negotiated, they they fought to make that deal, and uh, maybe they were trying for eight thousand dollars in the first place, and the promoter would only give five thousand and three thousand dollar three one thousand dollar bonuses. They incorporated that into the deal. They should get commission on that. So they always on live and i think everybody does that as commission on the gross but on uh records like i said i always commission on the net on records but uh sounds like you're running into contracts where people are taking 20 percent of everything regardless and oh I, yeah all the time yeah i ran into more on live performance other managers taking 10 or 15 percent generally not as high as 20. right on and on records you know there's a wide variety uh, well, I think if you're just starting out as a manager, it's it's a real it's really a lot to ask for someone to give you 20 percent of gross. Right. I mean, you have to you have to earn that. You have to you know earn that reputation and be able to really um, produce. Right. Um, if you're going to ask for something like that. But I, I, I that's still quite a bit. So the artist who is uh, so in need of uh, have been trying and trying to get a manager and, and they get an offer to be managed, but it's not a good one and they want to take it because they want to be managed. 
Well, yeah, that's exactly. And to, so Zena Moses had a question and related to that. And, and I mean, this is something I see often is, is managers approaching artists and artists, you know, being desperate to, to sign with any manager. And that's when, you know, they end up, you know, in my, in my clinic and I'm, and I end up with a horror story, but um, you know, it's something that we kind of covered, but, but that I do want to make sure that we, we covered adequately is, is, you know, how you check on the reputation of a manager or an agent. And I think that's, 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 that's less obvious than, than it seems, right? Because everyone through social media and websites start now, I mean, you can make yourself look like the management God of the universe, right? But, but that's not, you know, that's the, it's easy to put together a good website. It's, it's, it, it's hard to check on the actual reputation um, unless someone's been, you know, working in the sector for a long time, right? No, it's a really good question because, uh, and I'm glad you brought it up because there are a number of situations I've seen and personally seen with artists, maybe I've booked and I'm dealing with the manager. The manager's not good. You know, they, uh, I had a manager who we deliver offers to and they were urgent. I always felt like sense of urgency was one of the main things in, in booking. And days later, we talked to them, oh yeah, I got to contact him about that. I got to contact my artist. Well, what have you been doing the last few days? And I happened to know they had very few other responsibilities. And their artists, in some cases, the artist is successful in spite of the manager. So then you have a manager who looks great, but isn't necessarily. And it's very hard to do the research to find out where they're at. And sometimes maybe the artist themselves doesn't even realize that they are the one who's, who's making things happen. Um, so you want to use whatever. One really great tool is uh, to uh, check if you see the artist or the manager's roster, if there's a way to talk to anybody else on the roster and see what they're thinking. I represented an artist who's signed with a manager who were a close friend of his was already with that manager, but he didn't talk to him first. And he called him up and said, hey, I'm, I'm in the same stable now. I signed with the same manager. And he said, oh no, I just fired him. You should have talked to me. You know, he's horrible. Um, so do your research in advance. You know? And one other thing I should say, that, um, as far as people seeking out a manager or an agent, um, and we got asked all the time, and there was a few managers I really liked uh, that I could refer people to everybody else knew they were good. And so they had their hands full. You know, one was, uh, 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 I'm blanking on their names now all of a sudden, but in Vancouver, they do Elvis Costello and Ry Cooter and a bunch of others, and uh, Steve Macklin and uh, his partners. And, uh, and the other one is Ken Levitan in Nashville, who had a, man he managed managers who managed artists. You know, he, had a, he ended up with like 90 artists and maybe more by now. Um, but then they, the word gets around they're good and then they're full. And, they, and it's really, for anybody else on here who's thinking about that at all, it's a great career opportunity is pursuing management because there's a real great need for good managers. Um, but what I was gonna say is one thing for finding somebody that's good is uh, people would ask us for good managers. And I had a short list, but uh, they're really the right people to ask uh, if you're performing live and doing well, at certain venues, then ask the people that are booking that venue because they have more interaction with managers and agents than anybody else. And if you're playing that venue, then it's likely that they're dealing with other people of a similar musical uh, nature that might be appropriate. And they know this guy's jive, this guy's really efficient and honest and good, reliable, so on. So I think those are the best places to go. If you establish yourself at a venue, ask the venue buyer. They'll know what you, if you're doing well, they should appreciate you and want to do you the favor. And they know you and they know maybe who's going to be good for you. I think that is, is really solid advice. And I really appreciate that. And I think that that answers a lot of the questions that are in the chat about, you know, how to go about, you know, finding the right person, you know, and it, and it takes a while, right? It's going to take time. And, and, you know, it's better to, to wait and do your research and really establish those connections than to jump jump into something that you're not as familiar with. Um, I did have, I have had a couple of people ask if they can talk to you independently. And I will tell you all right now, Mike is retired. 
So he's given you a lot of advice. Uh, I promised him that I would not do that to him. So there's a reason why he's retired and that that would be his one of his uh, roles as a agent and or manager, but I'm not sure he wants to do that. So um, what you can do is reach out to me if you have specific questions and I can always ask Mike, but I, I, I don't want to sign him up for, for duty when, when he's, when he's, he, and trust me, he has to, he has to try really hard to be retired. So um, we don't, we don't want to, um, I, I don't want to enable him to going back to work full time. So, because I know it's, it's an easy thing for him to get into. Um, time i do love giving advice actually if i if i can so that's a great idea going through you if you want to pass things on to me that seem appropriate great um i would normally just answer anybody's questions but maybe there's a few too many here so thank you um, right now i'm i'm an, and i'm happy to do that and for those of you who are, who are in the chat asking about that then you you can reach me you know through, most of you know me but if you don't then you can reach us Re reach me through the ella project website and I'll get right back to you. So I'm looking to see if there's any other questions that I've missed today. Um, and I hope I haven't. Um, if I have, again, if if the folks here just want to email me, that would be super helpful. And I will make sure that that um, I get to Mike as appropriate. But um, so I think someone else wanted your notes too, and, and I can tell you I wouldn't give you my notes, so I wouldn't ex I would uh, I wouldn't expose uh, any trade secret. So I don't know that you want to do that, but but you know if you want to go through your notes and if you've missed something that you want to address, feel free to tell me, Mike, and I, I I can I can what we can do is just you know let folks we can start a thread from the from the staff to make sure that we pass any information that has been left out along to the to the participants. So. Uh, I'd, I'd be happy if I was more proud of them, but it's just a mass of text and assorted ideas that there's not enough time to get through everything. Well, I mean, you've, you've, you've had, you have, you know, a lot of anecdotes and a lot of experience, and it's really hard to uh, condense all that in a single workshop, but I think that you've done a, a, a fantastic job of covering all the big points and, and really, really appreciate you being here today. And so what I will do um, is, Kind of pass the mic back over. Well, unless you have anything else that you want to relay, Mike. No, not offhand. Um, it's great to see everybody here. Thanks for coming on. I'm seeing I have a new one here. <laughs> it's an old, an, a former employee who is wonderful to work with, and uh, it's always a, a treat seeing all these faces. Anyway. Right. Right. Thank well, you. thank you. Oh, thank you. An early, early uh, mentor. <laughs> You have a lot of fans, Mike. You really do. So, and I, I'm one of them. One other thing I wanted to address. So, Stephen Saloom, um, uh, he. What we'll do is we'll save the chat and we'll get this out to the to the participants. But talking about an opportunity to um, do a concert for the indigent defense. So, so that's something that you know. If, if for those of you who are, who are interested, just just jot that down. Make sure that you know you copy and paste that somewhere so that you can be in touch about that to the extent that you're interested. So otherwise, I will pass the mic back over to Jean to conclude this fantastic conversation and insight sharing and exchange. And again, can't thank you enough, Mike. You are an angel. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I like I love doing this. You know, so. All right. Oh, that Here was great. Go. Uh, thanks, thanks, Ashley. Thanks, Mike. Um, really, a really enjoyable and informative and enlightening afternoon. Um, really glad you took the time. Really glad that our audience took the time to join us today. Uh, we had a nice crowd here today, and we appreciate y'all's engagement, y'all's questions, and, and your being here. Um, know that as always, you know, Ella Project is here. Our, our legal clinics continue every week. Um, go to our website and fill out the application for those of y'all who need, may need specific legal issues. Um, if you're not signed up to our email list, go there and hit contact us. It's the best way to find out about some of our other upcoming programs, along with our Facebook channel. And I know we got plenty of people that came in that way. Uh, we're going to keep doing this stuff. Uh, we want to hear what you guys think is the most relevant, though. So don't be shy about sharing that information uh, with Ashley, with myself, with any of our board members, or et cetera. Um, and otherwise, just thanks for a lovely afternoon, and I uh, look forward to seeing y'all out and about as we get into carnival season in New Orleans. And until then, we're going to sign off. So y'all take care. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Mike. I love seeing you. Yeah, by the way, uh, 
I'm seeing here as I turn the page to more names on here, Bob Dickey, who I should do a shout out to. He was instrumental in me getting my first job as a booking agent in Milwaukee. So thanks. Well, Bob. shout out to him. That's great. That And you know what? That resulted in a lot of good for a lot of people that you've worked with and a lot of people here too. So thank, thank you. you. There you go. All right. All right. All right. Thanks, everyone.